Hey, 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 everyone. I know it takes time for us to turn on the machines and say hi, and everybody runs to their computers and laptops and their phones. First off, I want to thank everyone for thousands of birthday wishes I received for my 29th birthday again. I love 29 because 29 feels good. It's a constant reminder that I'll never be 30. So thank you for that wonderful birthday wishes and people sharing them. And and some of us say, oh, Facebook is dead. I don't think so. God, I saw thousands of wishes. It's crazy. Even though we're in TikTok and we're doing Instagram and we were talking about this a moment ago about how social media has changed the game. And nowadays, talent has taken the backseat more to you being credible and exciting and number one on social media as to what makes you become the star of today, you know? But we'll talk about that soon. So welcome to True House Stories. I am Lenny Fontana coming out of New York City. And I am bringing someone to the stage shortly that I revere as one of the greatest a r men to come out of the electronic dance music scene. And his roots, of course, begin in soul and R&B. And he will explain his life steps in our music business that it took to go from behind the record counter at the record shop and picking and being a selector, you know, and then promoter, record promoter, and then from record promoter, then to eventually, of course, DJing in the scene and then becoming an A&R man and really becoming an A&R man, changing the game in many different ways. And in house music, there's not many guys that have, or women, I should say, that have not 10 years, not 20 years, but we're talking about decades of history under their belt and helped shape a scene from both sides of the continents, from America to the European side, to the UK side, and all above and cross making this thing go and becoming even greater and bigger. And as music changed, his philosophy still stood the same. As I know, because I remember him saying it to me directly, as music was starting to get more, we could say EDM style, he decided to champion and stay with house music the way he saw it, the way he heard it. And the last part of this is, well, we'll say, is create an empire. An empire that went a few different ways. Not just because he was a great A&R man, but he also had the wonderful entrepreneurship and foresight to take it into the millennium. You know, again, coming from the last century and then still keeping the principles and then creating something that worked today that is still going strong and as popular as ever is a benchmark that people are going to be constantly still running to keep up with. So with no further ado, the DJ, the promoter, the a &R man, all the above, entrepreneur and all, Simon Dunmore, defective. defective. Welcome, uh, welcome, Simon. Well, firstly, Lenny, happy birthday. I didn't, I didn't know it was your birthday, and uh, you don't look much older than 29, so you're wearing it pretty well, actually. Um, and uh, thank you for the introduction, because uh, um, it's sometimes when you're in the middle of stuff, you actually don't realize actually what you're meaning or your involvement or, or, you know, or the end point of what you're doing. You're just doing it. And uh, it's only now um, that maybe I kind of look back and reflect and... Uh, and smile at the journey I've had. And, uh, yeah, been very fortunate, very lucky, very blessed. Not many, Not many are, around are around to talk about, talk that. about that. You are, you are, you are. You know? You know? Interpreted. 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 Areas. Areas. Some have left, some have left. This, 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 you know, all, you know, all reasons, 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 very blessed, very blessed to hear and strong, and, strong and, and, and still, still able, able to tell. So I'm so, I'm so proud, proud to take part of this show. Thank you for giving, your, giving time your time 
and letting and letting it. You know? You know? Yeah, my pleasure. I have time now, which is good. So, uh, yeah, all good. Yeah, and thank you for the invite. I appreciate being here. And believe, and believe people are going to be able to have, have paper. paper. So, so do not do hold not back. back. And what and you, what you and, 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 and we said, we said, we said, you know what I'm okay. saying? You know what I'm saying? Okay, I've got plenty to say. <laughs> well, well, let's get right, let's get right into this. Let's, let's say this. I asked the I same, asked the same question, question, and it seems to apply to everyone. How does music, how does music, music the young the Simon, 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 of course, of course, and then as your life, as your life gets how, sorry, you dropped out. How does music? What? Sorry. How does music? How does music as you younger, as you younger, teenager, teenager. It kind. Of, you know what? It, I kind of remember. Um, the first thing I re I, I knew music. Like you know, you're a kid. The radio's on. Your parents play music, and and I, I you know, music was always around me. My mum my and dad didn't have particularly good taste, so it wasn't great music that was around me. They, you know, they like Glenn Campbell and Gene Pitney and. Uh, you know, I had some some pretty kind of middle of the road pop music back in the day. But the first thing that I really remember was buying a, a magazine called Smash Hits, which was basically a magazine which had all the lyrics of all the of all the records that were in the charts um, at that time. And um, David Bowie's Life on Mars had just come out, and uh, I, I liked the record. I didn't, yeah, I, you know, I didn't really. I was ten. And I didn't really, you know, I wasn't like a massive Ziggy Stardust and, and you know, uh, fan. I just liked this one record. And there was a lyric in there called Mickey Mouse has gone up the cow. And I was like, what, what does that mean? And it really kind of puzzled me. I now know that David Bowie used to cut out uh, lines from magazines and shift them around and put them together. And, and that that was a, a source of his lyrics. And, 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 and I'm kind of imagining that that's what he did in that instance, because Mickey Mouse has gone up the cow just means it's just random. Yeah. But that's my earliest recollection of being really kind of fascinated with, with, with music. And, um, you know, I, 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 this was in the glam rock era. So I liked the gl glam rock records that were played on the radio, Sweet and Mud and David Bowie and Status Quo and Slade and whatever. And you'll have to forgive me. I was super young. Uh, most of those records, David Bowie aside, don't sound so great these days. But, um, um, but that was what was popular at the time. Um, and then the first thing that really... I really took notice of that was a real jolt in my kind of like musical conscience, so to speak, was punk rock. Um, because nobody knew what hit them when that, you know, when, when, when the sex pistols were on the TV swearing at presenters and, and, you know, trashing stages and kind of like the anti-establishment uh, rebellious kind of part of that music rebelling against the kind of the way the mainstream had, had come. And, um, um, and you know, when, when 76, I was 14 years old again, I didn't really understand it. I was too young to go to the gigs, but, but really kind of fascinated um, by it. And then I, I, you know, I went through all of the, the musical, um, um, uh, movements that, um, that were around at the time and music at that time was very tribal. So, you know, I, I was aware of what was going on in punk. Two tone was a big thing. New romantics was a big thing um disco was a big thing the soul scene soul boys in the uk um and you know influenced by all of those all of those movements and uh um so I, you know i i feel pretty blessed to have experienced those eras you know listening to fast tracking a little bit but you know going to a club and and the whole club singing may's joy and pain you know, I don't know what tempo that record is, 85 BPM or whatever, something that would really struggle in these times, but a whole club in unison singing that record word to word or Kenny Burt rising to the top and, you know, th those kind of records. And, and um, you know, that's that stands strong with me, with me now. You know, I look back at that and, 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 and smile inside and outwardly. So, so that was my that was my my early introduction to music. And what I'm going to do is when I speak, because I'm having some analog, uh, 
feedback. I'm just going to mute you and then I'll unmute you. So I'm not being um, insulting because what's happening is we're getting a, like a delay. I don't know if it's something with the echo. Go. Yeah. So, 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 hold on one second. Hold on one second. Let me just, so here's my question. So of course you could never have those type of tempo changes now because you can, but you know how the night works comparing to then, because even Francois has always said, Kevorkian has always said the same thing. You've had nights where in the middle of the night, you would have a fast record and then drop down to have a reset. You could never, you know, it's very difficult to do that now in these days. Days. I've seen, I've seen it occasionally, um, but DJs have to be really brave and 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 really just on, on top of their game and know that they've got their their audience and their dance floor in a place where they can they can jolt people like that. And when people are jolted on the dance floor, it all it, it's a great thing because it, it you know you remember it, you remember those moments on the dance floor. I mean, everything's so seamless now and so syncopated and and i understand the craft of mixing is is really important but when you know my early days of clubbing they would the dj would would mix not mix but blend and sequence and 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 curate a night by playing some rare groove some soul maybe a little bit of jazz, maybe a little bit of hip hop, some early house and definitely some garage records and some records like inner life or D train or, you know, things that were coming out on South soul or prelude, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and Philly. I mean, Philly, of course, probably my favorite label uh, uh, of all time. And, you know, they're kind of the soul records, they're disco records, they're, you know, they're, uh, and, 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 and they're classic. They, they, they were written, and, and arranged and you know they had string in, uh, uh, sections and you know people that would go in and arrange the whole musical journey i mean i, I remember listening to a little holloway record that's like um it's like nine minutes long and for start to finish it's not doing the same thing for you know for any kind of like extended moment in time now a record is nine minutes long it literally starts and stops pretty much does the same thing throughout and um so those records kind of kept kept you interested but the dj what the point i'm trying to make was would literally cull his set from the best of multiple genres and then play them across the board and the, the audience and the dance floor would go with them you know i, I remember seeing norman j or you know playing at, at, at uh shake and finger pop or good times or whatever and he, he'd play you know a chic record next to uh and a diva record next to uh, um, blah, 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 you know, um, whatever. It was eclectic, super eclectic, and and good for it. Did you make it to Wigan to the Wigan Casino during that time, the Northern Soul time? Uh, I was, I was, I was definitely too young. Plus, that was the Northern Soul scene, much more kind of up tempo and 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 much more driven. And and I was more into Southern Soul, which was a bit more kind of laid back bit more groovy a uh, bit more kind of schmoochy in, in in the lyrics love songs and uh and more two-step it was you know it's always been that kind of divide in in the uk between the north and the south where you know when disco was big in the south high energy was huge in in the north they like their records way way more driven i mean probably because of the drugs they take in all honesty ska Rockability, rockability, and soul. I'm presuming is more your, let's say, your pedigree. So, early days, I was. <laughs> this is always uh, makes me chuckle. Um, I was deeply affected by Elvis dying, and I, I just remember the headline, and I was never really into Elvis, but you know, the, the radio stations played all of his records for. a I don't know, days on end and whatever. And it kind of got me into that sound, but it was a little bit too polished and commercial for me. And I ended up like in rockabilly. It became a thing for me. Um, and um, what happened was, uh, you know, there was a community of, of people that were into that scene and that sound. And uh, there was lots of parties hanging on, uh, uh, being held around London. And, I, and you know, I became part of, of, of that crew. Um, but what happened is I went to college and I had to leave London and I went to college in Derby and there was no scene there whatsoever. 
Um, so I just kind of moved away from that sound. The college was a fashion college. And um, so there was a lot of kind of um, very kind of fashionable people um, attending. And the the new thing was new romantics and, you know, Spandau Ballet and Visage and uh, all the things that was going on at the Blitz Club and whatever. So I, I, I kind of became a little bit influenced um a little bit influenced by that the stepping stone in between was a brief moment a, a brief two-tone moment with um with the specials and madness and stuff and you know it, it was like it was like they were the things that were hitting you over the head when you were you know you were young and you were into music in the in the uk in the late 70s and, and early 1980s so at that time of course you're now going to become a, a record promoter, I guess, or you're working at a record shop. You'll tell us the events of how it steps from college, because that's funny that you actually was in a fashion college. So was Frankie Knuckles, and they wound up not doing anything with fashion, as you know. Frankie became Frankie Knuckles, and Larry Levan became Larry Levan, and they were both into that type of stuff of doing fashion designing. So music and fashion always work, but I'll let you tell the events. events. Well, so basically what happened was, um, you know, the the, the, um, the new romantic scene was very uh, influenced by by progressive music. It, you know, things like records like Kraftwerk and, 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 and stuff like that were huge on that scene. And, you know, the electronic scene was just starting to begin. I guess people had sequences and drum machines and, and whatever, and it made people music really, uh, certainly dance music, easier to produce. Um, and also disco. I mean, if you listen to early Spandau Ballet records with, you know, chant number one, it's a disco record, essentially. Haircut 100, favourite shirt, a disco record. So it was a kind of mixture of all of those things. And I kind of gravitated more to the disco side of things. And, you know, disco obviously died uh, a pretty ugly death quite quickly with the disco sucks thing. Um, you know, obviously there were all sorts of... Um, um historical kind of versions of that whether it be a racist thing or you know the the the, the record company it, record industry kind of recoiling against disco because it never sold albums and it was traditionally a rock business and they couldn't cope with you know, the homophobia that was maybe associated with that anyway disco sucks happened but out of that came the garage scene and, and records that we talked about earlier with you know like um uh d train or uh, inner life or um maxine singleton don't you love it records that i absolutely still love to this day and they were kind of post disco pre house um and they they were the records that i started to buy um i'd go down to my in, import shop and i'd buy these records i'd buy some rare groove records and all of my friends and all of my circle were unaware of these records so i would make them tapes i'd go i'd go buy my records i'd take them back i'd pick the favorite album track i'd pick my favorite 12 inch my 7 inch um a lot some jazz some obscurities um, and I would make people tapes, and these tapes became so popular uh, in the area of West London that I lived in, Uxbridge, um, that people started to ask me to DJ. Um, this story is told by so many people. It's a similar journey, and, and it's just all about music curation, basically, and passing your knowledge on and passing your taste on. So Making cassettes for people is my first example, probably, of music curation. Um, and, you know, it, it, it led me to become a DJ. Um, when I was DJing, I, um, I hustled. I, 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 I earned a little bit of money by writing for Blues and Soul. I earned a little bit of money by um, putting on coaches to gigs and events in London that I thought people would like to go to. Things like Nicky Holloway Special Branch, Giles Peterson will be playing, Pete Tong will be playing, Norman Jay, Jay Strongman, uh, you know, very popular D, Bob Jones. Um, and these events were held in central London and I would organise a coach, a pick-up point, a meet point at the end of the night and drive everybody back. And again, it was about bringing like-minded people together to go to an event. Um and, and I was just just ways of, of, of trying to earn a living without having a proper job, basically. Um, and then to be closer to the source, to get my records earlier, to be, you know, in the real thick of it. Uh, I ended up getting a job at a place called Record and Disco Centre in West London. 
Um, and that was my job behind the counter. Uh, the record van would, would uh, again, music curation. Uh, curation. So uh, a van would turn up with all the hottest 12 inches that had just landed at, at Heathrow Airport. They'd stop by the... Uh, the shop, and and again, this story could be told in New York or, or or Berlin or Paris or you know any special independent store. The van would pull over. You'd go in. You'd take a pile of records out. You'd play them on the deck. You'd go. I'll have fifteen of that. I have fifty of that. I'll have a hundred of that. If you thought it was a you know, and and you go, I can only give you thirty because I've got to give other shops some, and I've got a limit and whatever. But you, but the whole point of it was you were buying records then to sell to DJs. And um, so your taste and, 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 and your selection had to be in line. The great thing about it was, was if you gave it to the right DJs and they played the records, then you'd get a second wave of demand because the punters would come in and say, they'd have a list of records that Norman Jay had played or Bobby and Steve had played or Paul Anderson had played and whatever. And they'd come in, have you got this? Have you got this? And sometimes it would be a promo and they'd have to wait. Sometimes it would be an import and it'd be out of stock. And, and that kind of demand that was created just added to the, to the hype of records. Um, but what also happened was record labels used to come to my store and give me a box of promos to give to the DJs for the exact reason I was talking about now. So they would then play them to their audience and they would create a buzz. Um, and I guess the feedback that I gave them and uh, the, the, the way that I pushed them eventually led me uh, to be offered a job doing club promotions at a label called Cool Tempo Records, which was a hot UK dance imprint of Chrysalis Records at the time. Um, and I did club promotions and... Once I got my foot in the door at a record label, there was nothing else I wanted to do. I was absolutely nothing was going to stop me. And and that's when I had met you too around that time, Cool Temple, when you were down there as well. I remember that. Um, and you were great at that job. It wasn't like you didn't. It, so the, initially at the record shop in Rainers Lane, you know, you get your education on how you're listening as a DJ, but you're also playing A and R as well. And even though you're not being an A and R, but you are. It's like it's like you're doing your, as you call your apprenticeship in England. I love that word. It's like you were getting ready, you know, to yeah. to to have that next moment of. But pre to that, you were writing for Blues and Soul, correct? How long did that last? Last uh, probably about eighteen months. I used to. I, I also used to do a little fanzine called London Soul Circular, where I'd. I it was literally. I, I'd photocopy a. a, a a sheet of paper and I'd post it to people and it had record reviews and gig updates and uh, it was very basic it, you know it's like a little fanzine thing I and mean, we were talking you know 1984 it was you know I just got a compact computer I mean it barely did anything other than you know process some some words it you know and then you know the, the amazing thing was when you could actually put people's address into it and it would print out labels with people's address and it would save you writing out all of that shit that used to take ages of time. It's just like we lived through all of this. You know, I, it was like if I wanted to speak to a DJ, there was no email, there was no WhatsApp. There, I had to, I had to phone them. You know, and they had to be in, and maybe you know, they, maybe they were busy and they weren't, so I had to call back. And Jesus, it was like everything was was long back in the day. It was uh, people don't realize how easy they have it have it these days. Anyway. <laughs> Um, but you know that you know that was it. So, like I said, I did lots of shit. I just hustled. I just wanted to be involved. Uh, literally, every waking minute was uh, evolved around shouting about records, or, or promoting records, or promoting about gigs, or talent that I loved, or DJs that I wanted to go and see. The subtext of it, probably, I mean, is I wanted to impress girls. Probably, I just wanted to be cool. I worked really hard at trying to be cool, probably never really succeeding, but you know, I think that that's, that's a driving force for a lot of people. Let me, let me say this, you know, I had Ralphie D on the show from Odyssey 2001, you know, part of the disco movement and Saturday Night fever. And what did he say? The same thing, two things he did washed and waxed his car and thought about women to, and DJing was just, you know, like, hey, I'm. This is super cool, but I wanted to meet the women. So when you say that, that seems to be similar with a lot of the people. I think I, I think it's a common thing. Plus, I'm a terrible dancer. I was never going to be successful on the dance floor. So, being cool behind the decks and just, you know, 
and just trying to uh try to impress people with selection i mean music is is really important to a lot of people you know and 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 uh you know one of the memes i see very regularly on instagram is people that introduce you to music are important and 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 i really think that that shouldn't be underplayed um and the problem that there is now is it's just it just comes at you relentlessly from all angles and sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming. Well, back in the day, when it came at you in a much kind of slower, more considered way, things would really sink in. I mean, TikTok, I can't reconcile with TikTok. You listen to a record for 15 fucking seconds. How can you listen to a record for 15 seconds? If you only listen to a record for 15 seconds, it can't be very good. Well, maybe the chorus is good. But it's all about, for me, it's about what the story of a record tells. You know, the intro, the middle eight, the vamp section. You know, I, I listen, you know, the South Soul Orchestra seconds. I can listen to that record every day for the rest of my life because... She's talking about she had to go back for seconds because she just wasn't satisfied. She had to go back to see her guy because she wanted some more. And then in the middle of it, she tells why she went back and she banged on his door. And then, you know, Lillette Holloway just goes on this vamp and it's it's soul and it's disco and it's just arranged and and whatever. And it's, um, I, you know, I, I, I get pretty. So this this is me. OK. I like to shout about shit that I like, right? So making cassettes is me shouting about shit that I like. Working behind the counter, I'm shouting about stuff that I like. DJing, I'm playing stuff to people. I'm sharing my musical taste. I'm shouting about stuff. Signing records that I like is shouting about. Creating a label, all of them are just extensions of what I like personally. Um, the platforms just got bigger as time time went on. Um, and, uh, you know, I can't read music. I can't write music. I, I dabbled at being a producer. I always thought my shit sounded terrible when I listened to a David Morales record or a Masters of War record. So I chickened out. I gave up and decided that if I can't make those records, I'm damn well sure going to shout about Hang on. What was the first song you remixed under the name Touchdown? Probably I did some early production for Kenny Thomas, who's a blue eyed soul boy out of the UK. I did some work with Money Love. I did a few things with a diva. I remixed, I remixed the Jodeci record, which shocks the hell out of people when, when I say that, um, my heart belongs to you. Sounds pretty good. Now I think I kind of channeled an Isley brothers record and just kind of like put layered it underneath some amazing vocals, but you know, it was still not enough for me. And, um, you know, I have imposter syndrome. I, I still probably have imposter syndrome where it's just like I'm super lucky to have this job. Um, I was super lucky to, 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 to be able to speak to Todd Terry. I mean, I remember the first time I got a job and I had to phone up, you know, whoever. And I would sit there at like a nervous wreck. I was speaking to my heroes. Um, and, I, you know, and when, uh, I still feel like that with some people. I still feel like with some people. So, uh, so yeah, so, 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 so some early stuff, but it was never, it was never my future. Okay. So what became of your partner in the remix and who was it that you worked with on that stuff? Okay. So, um, one of the first guys I worked with was a guy called Steve McCutcheon. Um, Steve McCutcheon played keyboards for me as my engineer. If I needed to sample a record, he would do all of that. Steve McCutcheon wrote Ed Sheeran, Shape of You, the biggest streaming record of all time. He did well. He did really, really, really good. And it just shows that where you start, everyone starts from, from small beginnings, and you never know where your journey is going to take you. Everyone's, everybody, everybody starts at zero. Um, and it's how and it's how your life grows and whether you get lucky and whether the right door opens for you or whether the right person puts their arm around you, gives you guidance. Mentors are super important. I've had some incredible mentors in my life. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I've listened to them and I've learned from them. Uh, I still hold most of them dear. And, um, you know, it's like without them, I wouldn't be 
uh, I wouldn't have done what I did or who I am. So, At heart, you're a soul boy. We know that because I remember even you telling me that. What would be the top three soul records of all time? And if one does not carry the name, Bobby Womack, of course. Of course. Oh, come on. <laughs> Of course, Bobby Womack. What I mean, it's it's um, it's an impossible it's an impossible question to answer because it depends on your mood. It depends what comes into your head. Um, now I have an, an Arista Seven with Bobby Womack. One side is "How Can You Break My Heart," the other side is "Give It Up." I think I actually prefer "Give It Up." He just he just the way he, he delivers it. It's just like from it's from down here. And um, so Bobby Womack for sure, hundred um, percent. Depends on your de definition of soul. I mean, um, don't leave me this way, Teddy Pendergrass. I mean, a, like a record that is actually an anthem today and still gets played on, the, and people lose their shit because it's just you know everything about it is uh, you know soulful. It's also it's obviously a disco, early disco record as well. Um, and then, oh God, who else could you pick? Um, who else could I pick? Um, I'd, I'd say, um, who can I? Um, Ruby Andrews, just loving you, right? It's an old modern soul, northern soul record. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty rare collectible seven inch. It's pretty obscure. I don't know why it's just come into my head, but you asked me to pick three and there you are. And you did good. Cool tempo begins for you. Okay. Explain to people your tenure there and what made you go from there on to your next job. So my job was to send DJs records and, 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 get DJs to persuade them to play the records and persuade to put them in charts. And they would then have to fax their chart to Record Mirror. And if enough DJs charted your record, you would go up in the Record Mirror club chart. And if you got to number one, normally Radio One would look at that chart and go, this record's hot. We're going to consider it for playlist. Or at least we'll talk about it. That was my job. And um, promoting good records is easy. You put them in a mailer, DJ gets and plays it, goes, that's slamming. I'm going to play it this week. And, you know, I want to keep on Cool Tempo's main list. They send me good records. I'm going to chart it for Simon. No problems at all. The problem comes when you have a bad record that you, you, that you have to promote. And, you know, not, not every record was great that we worked with. So for me to make it more palatable for, other, for DJs to play and easier for me to promote... I'd commission remixes. So I'd commission a Masters at Work remix or a Heller and Farley remix or a Paul Oakenfold remix or a Frankie Knuckles mix, Todd Terry, you know, whatever, to try and make it more um, easier to program on the dance floor. And obviously, some of those remixes were, well, not obviously, but a lot of those remixes were better than the originals. And um, But that gave me my first kind of slight uh, foot in the door in terms of A&R. Just, just by remixing records, just trying to make a record better than it than it than it was the it, the version that I'd been given from the outset. Um, but then I'd go into a record shop on a Saturday or the weekend, and I'd buy a record, and it would come in from America, and I knew that the rights were available uh, for the UK. So I'd then go to my boss, my the A and R man, and I'd go, "If you sign this record, I can I I, I can deliver it. I'll do a great job on it. This, this is DJs are playing it, people are dancing to it. It's got a shot." And I signed two or three records, Elias Follow Me, River Ocean, um, Love and Happiness, uh, Juliet Roberts Caught in the Middle, uh, records that did did really well and 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 not not huge crossover successes, but definitely crossover successes. Um, and then my boss left, he left Cool Tempo to go and work at AM to start AMPM Records. Um, and I got his job. So I I I progressed from being a club promotions guy to um to an a and r guy and um uh what happened was uh the guy's name was steve wolf and he was one of the mentors that i talk about he, he taught me amazing ethics about how to work within the music industry but he then got offered the job as head of a and r at mca universal so he left a and m and um 
I, I that was an opportunity for me. I applied for the job. I got the job. I was then running the A A and M dance department, club promotions department, and um, and just continued the legacy of of, of A M P M Records. A M P M Records had already had C C Peniston finally. Gypsy Woman, Crystal Waters, Sounds of Blackness, The Pressure. I mean, it was the shit as a label, um, and it was it was they were big shoes to follow. And uh, but eventually, we signed Alternate A Three or Moose T Horny or Alcatraz. Give me love. Did all the remixes on Janet Jackson's Div- Design of a Decade um, album. Now that's uh, uh, that, no computer on the desk. Look at that, eh? It's um, it's just one of those things that uh, lots of paper, and um, and yeah, and and uh, so we ended up. We ended up uh, doing pretty well, following some some uh, some pretty big shoes actually, and uh, I'm pretty proud proud of my time there and the records that we signed and the fact that a lot of them, you know, things like Love Tribe, um, Stand Up, and and uh, still sound, in my opinion, still still sounds really good today. And you can't download it; it's not available. It's not available to download. It's not available to stream on Spotify. So I guess that you know the, the the classics. I mean, Anne Nesby, the Moose T remix of "Can I Get a Witness?" Incredible, incredible record. Still sounds amazing. So yeah, you know, Wolfie's a character, <laughs> and God bless Wolfie because he did mentor a lot of us in the in that early part of house music. Especially, you know, he was he had the fortitude to pick up a lot of records when this thing was just beginning. So you were already coming in off a strong, um, let's see, like he left a pretty strong legacy AMPM. How long were you there before you rolled over to your current situation? Um, I was there for four years and um, uh, it was, you know, I learned, I learned a lot being responsible for, for budgets and 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 uh, you know marketing campaigns and uh, profit and loss force P and L forecast profit and loss forecast and whatever you know if your record did well everybody loved you if your record didn't do so well you you know you got kicked in the ass and 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 whatever and you know some of the things that were not so successful was because some people possibly didn't deliver they were beyond your control but you still had you still had the responsibility not only internally to the record label but also to the artist and to the manager um but what it did do that five years at cool tempo and the four years at uh, a and m it i got to know a lot of people i got to know a lot of djs i got to know a lot of producers i got to know a lot of labels um i had really great relationships pretty much across the board and it was part of my job so somebody else was paying for it i mean if you start an independent label cold from the get-go and you're starting from ground zero that's a pretty tough proposition and 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 i don't envy in fact i anyone that's managed to make that work is 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 uh amazingly tenacious and talented and 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 uh and just total focus to make that work because it's definitely not easy uh, and I grew in in all of those areas on somebody else's his money. Um, but what happened was Universal bought Polygram. Polygram owned A and M, and they merged A and M with Ireland. And and I I didn't really want to go and work for uh, Ireland. And uh, at the same time, Ministry of Sound offered me some startup money to start my own label because they wanted access to repertoire for their compilations. Um, so they offered me some money to start my own label and um, it was just the right moment in time Um, it was uh, uh, it was kind of risky and reckless and and just definitely pumped me full of adrenaline because you know if 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 I failed I failed on my terms if I succeeded I, I succeeded on my terms but there was nowhere to hide you couldn't go and hide where the company's doing well because Sting's having a hit, or Cheryl Crow's having a hit, or whatever, and I'll just, I'll just, you know, free wheel for a little moment of time. You had to be on your toes the whole time, and um, and also I just started a family at that. Uh, the year I started Defected is the year that my my first um, son was born. So there, there was that pressure as well. So I was I was definitely hunter gatherer at that moment. I had to go out and and. Uh, and, and kill to eat because I had, I had to support myself and I had to support my family. 
made me uh, really focused. It really focused me. And the affected story begins, of course. And I remember those stories right in the beginning, beginning, because I was right there as it as it unfolded. Um, and also, like you said, tenacity. You had to be the warrior, and you couldn't hide behind anybody and say, "Oh, who did you take with you with when you started the, the company from A and M? Who was part of the staff that came along?" Um, Janet Bell. Uh, came came with me and um, and then we hired uh, a receptionist uh, PA to answer the phone and there was just three of us we we quickly hired uh, a club promotions person um, and uh, we we uh, we wanted to be close to the action so one of the things that we did uh, black market records was one of the biggest uh, import record stores uh, in London at that time and if you were a DJ, you probably went there on a Friday or a Saturday. And if you were a DJ from out of town coming in from New York to play Ministry of Sound or whatever, you would go to Black Market as well. So we uh, hired an office directly opposite Black Market. We literally could look out of our window in almost onto the decks and see what they were playing. Uh, it was that close. And so when a DJ went into Black Market, they literally just walked across the street and um and we gave them our promos we gave them our latest releases and we not just gave it to them. we said this is why you need to play this this is why you need to support this this is hot I, i've only given it to five people even if you're giving it to 50 you still told them you're giving it to five and they thought they were special and you had that that dialogue with people and that connectivity with people that that, that made it real special and even if they didn't walk over the, the the road we could see them in the shop and we'd walk over the road and we'd give them we'd give them a promo we'd also we had access to the imports that were coming in so we would literally be hearing records as they came off the van and were being racked behind the counter um and so we knew what who what remixes were hot what djs were asking for um and and whatever it just it, we we just had our finger right on the pulse by being opposite black market what was the first initial record you came out with to start defected did soul searcher um i would signed records from from jazz and groove and brian tapper and mark pomeroy uh when we were at AM, we signed a record from strictly monet we can make it which is is an incredible soulful record but the dub just had this elongated kind of fed back looped vocal which just just tore clubs apart and had a really good relationship with them and we'd signed uh, michael proctor records and 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 uh, and whatever and um they 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 put out an import um soul search you can't get enough which was just it was a, a gary's gang sample and um it was a it was a track it didn't have the full song but it was doing business on the dance floors and a lot of the specialist radio shows were playing it at the weekend on, on Kiss. Trouble was playing it. Bobby and Steve were playing it. Norman Jay was playing it. So you knew that the record had heat. And I, I, I found out and I said, look, I want this record to be the first release, but can you put a song on it? And uh, Mark Pomeroy went, went away and he, um, he sang the song that he wrote to me over the phone. And I loved it. I was like, that's it. It's so good. Lyrics were so good. And then they got Thea Austin to um, to sing it. And and Thea was the the the, the singer from Snap, um, who had, you know, sang rhythm as a dancer and whatever. So she, you know, so she had pedigree. She sang on the record and um and we put it out and it it came, it was a hit off the bat, sold a hundred thousand records, top ten in the UK pop chart, and it was um it was a when I when I left A and M M and started my own label, it was really funny because the people didn't necessarily pick up the phone, pick up the phone anymore. I didn't have A and R budgets, you know. I, I didn't have I didn't have you know couldn't sign records for a lot of money, pay a lot of people for remixes and whatever. And and some people that were were I thought to be friends, a big lesson in the music industry. Eh? They were just like, well, you've got to prove yourself again. And then when we proved ourselves again by having a top 10 record, everyone picked up the phone again. So it, it solved uh, a, a multitude of, of conundrums about um, starting starting your phone business. And also we had a lot of goodwill. People knew that A&M had been 
had been disbanded and that we'd probably been given a bit of a rough ride uh, and people wanted to support us so you know the press supported us specialist radio supported us and we created enough of a buzz to give us a platform to take that record to mainstream radio and we and we got the love that i think that the record deserved simon how long did you last with ministry as your backer we lasted about three years um it was a it was a it was a, an interesting relationship i mean they they were our partners and the competition at the same time I and mean, they were signing records we were signing records sometimes we would go for the same records i'd bid ten thousand pounds for a record they'd bid 50 and i couldn't compete with that so um so we ended up butting heads a little bit but what happened was I wanted to sign Kings of Tomorrow finally. And it was a record that I heard played at the Winter Music Conference and, uh, Conference, and Tony Humphreys was was champion in it. And, you, you know, it's an amazing song. It just, you know, you could, you, you, you know, you got, got it you know, back in the day, 2001, 2002, you know, you got emotional listening to that record. Anyway, I, the people that owned it, Distance Records, they, they wanted a lot of money. And... I love the record so much. I paid way, way more. I wanted to pay way, way more than I could afford, but I just felt it was a seminal record. And Ministry came to me because they were they were backing me financially, and they said, "You can't pay this much money for that record. It's a deep house record. It's not a hit." And I'm like, "Yeah, but culturally, it's an amazing record. It's a call to arms for the whole scene, and every DJ that I want to be supporting Defected is playing this record." And that's important in if you're going to have longevity as a label. They didn't see it that way. We ended up falling out. Um, and uh, I eventually signed the record. Uh, you know, I guess history says I was right because it was, uh, you know, it's a record that still gets played today, still sounds amazing today. It's probably the, the, the record that I've probably heard most in my life in terms of repeat plays or whatever and it, it, i'm still not tired of listening to it um but it was such a, a a difference of um of opinions they wanted hits i wanted culture um and um we parted company i owed them a heap load of money we came to an arrangement i paid them back i think it took me almost a decade to pay them back um what they lent me but we did pay them back um, and because of that, Defected became my my own my own company, my own business. Everybody's wondering why my transitions are kind of sloppy. It's because I'm having an echo issue, and I have to mute him. And it doesn't it's like maybe I'm speechless. No, I just want to make sure we don't have this echo. So, you know, when you you know you're dealing with that checkbook that you had before with ministry and now that checkbook is not there any longer is it still easy for you to still make those maneuvers or do you have to really think thoroughly about every move you're making as an a or owner of that label yeah i mean you you know one one thing that um yeah you have to think about everything and you know i mean i lots of successful businesses go under because because of cash flow they may you know their business may be sound or they just run out of money and they you know and whatever and, and you know i felt when i left a&m that i knew how to run a record label and that may be true i may you know but i didn't know how to run a business and the moment we opened our doors was the most it was a learning curve beyond anything i've ever experienced and there's you know people make mistakes and, and that's fine. That's acceptable practice in whatever you do, but just don't make the same mistake twice. That's unforgivable. So learn from everything that's around you. Learn from your successes and why they're successful and whatever, but learn equally from your, your mistakes. Um, and just you, you need to just put together a picture. I mean, I was very fortunate to work with, we talked about mentors. I worked at a major label, so I, I understood the way that they operated and the good things that they, they did in terms of promotion and marketing, etc. I also worked with Strictly Rhythm quite extensively, and Mark Finkelstein taught me how to run a business as an, an independent label. And, you know, without his guidance, I, you know, I, I think we would have gone, gone out of business. I also worked with the Ministry of Sound, who were amazing at marketing. 
back in those in in in, in those days. Um, you know, they would do stuff like shine a, their image on the, the side of the Houses of Parliament or Buckingham Palace, and it would be in the newspaper the next day. And and um, you know, th these were the days when when those things had had a meaningful effect. So I learned the major labour way. I learned the independent way. I learned the marketing way. I learned about. Uh, the finances of of you know doing compilations alongside putting out singles and um and then um when radio decided that it wanted to just play hits and wanted to play music from big artists and wanted and stop supporting dance music and start uh, and stop supporting independent labels i learned how to put on events and go on the road and and promote my music in a completely different way just out of necessity if we didn't go on the road and we weren't getting our records played on the radio, how were people going to hear our records? How were we going to connect with our audience? So, you know, Marillo had started subliminal sessions and I was like defected of in the house. We were in a club near you and we started the compilation series um, and the, uh, and the events as well. But it was because I was surrounded by, different scenarios within the business and i just i just soaked it all up and uh, and learned from it and applied it to um our business as and when it was needed um but yeah it was uh it um uh, we couldn't compete with the majors they've they've always got more money than us so we have to be cre creative and um supporting the culture is more important than support and, and this is going to fast track us maybe into social media now now it's all about numbers it's all about well, how well, well we, we you know back then for me it's all about the culture it's all about longevity it's all about you know having a community and treating that community well and and you know chance was big i didn't sign trance records edm was big i didn't sign edm records drum and bass was big i didn't sign drum and bass records because i wanted my community of DJs and record store people and punters and club goers to feel that what they were into was important to me. And I just didn't go off in a different direction for the money. And that's why I was going to ask you, why didn't you sign when it was that easy to go and grab an EDM record or a jungle record? Why stay true to champion this house music? Dick? Because because I didn't, I didn't understand them. I didn't like them. They didn't, they didn't make me feel tight in my stomach because I fucking loved them. And I, I remember listening to the Beatport Top Five when EDM was just exploding, and and and, and I was with my A and R team, and I just looked at them and went, "This is fucking horrible. I just, I just can't go there. It's, it, it stops being your passion and then becomes a job." And that's always a dangerous thing. And I just went, if we're going to die, let's at least die standing for something. Let's put our flag in the ground and say, this is what we represent and, that, and this is what we mean. And it's not about being popular globally. It's about reaching the people that are, are aligned with you. And the, the internet was a great thing for that because we could connect with people globally. And I don't know what the, the house music community it was in terms of numbers in in 2011 whether it was 500,000 people whether it was a million or two million it's just we wanted to be meaningful to those people and that's a pretty good audience you know um and we realigned our business to to appeal to those people we made cutbacks hard decisions were made tough conversations with employees or tough conversations with um uh, artists that you can't afford to pay them as much as what they think they deserve but stick with us it's a moment in time we'll get through this together you know when you don't have money speak uh, hard conversations with suppliers i can't pay you now just please work with me if i go out of business you're not going to get paid so you're no worse off just just stick with me eventually i'll, I'll you know i i i i'll i'll pay you but uh um those things come along and they challenge you and if you're clever you can learn you can learn a lot from them um it's easy to operate when everything's going well um it's it's actually when i look back at it and and, and surviving when a lot of our competitors went out of business is probably something that i'm actually most proud of so 
Here's a, here's a question that it just came to my mind. Do you, are you sorry to see the physicals go away and this digital streaming become the, the next move? move? Uh, in some ways, in some ways, I think that um, there was a level of curation and 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 a le level of uh, investment involved with putting out a physical record that people don't have to take that chance now. So it makes them it far easier to put a record out. You know, it, back in the day, you would have to press some vinyl, you'd have to cut some lacquers, uh, you'd have to go to a mastering studio, you'd have to do some test pressings. All of these things cost you money. Then you'd have to press 1,000, 5,000, whatever records, all of which was an investment, and you didn't know if you were going to get your, your money back. So let's just say the figure to put a record out back in the day was £10,000. You'd think about, you think pretty hard about sending, spending ten thousand pounds. Now people don't have to think about anything; they just fucking upload it. And even if it's a piece of shit, it doesn't matter. But it's just noise that's out there. I mean, someone told me today there's ninety thousand releases a day. It may be a week, but I'm sure they said a day on Spotify. That's a lot of shit to wade through to get your record heard. And the reason the reason that there's that much music is because there's no risk involved. Whereas back in the day, you know, even if you press your record, then the distributor would hear it and he'd have to go, I'm not buying that. That's a terrible record. I'm not going to ship it. I don't believe in it. And then the person behind the record store and then the DJ. And, and there was like several layers of curation which don't exist anymore. And I think that's probably missed to some extent. Um but at the same time, everyone deserves a chance. Everybody deserves an opportunity. Who am I to say someone's record is a good or a bad record? And whatever. I can only say what I like personally. There are lots of records that do really well that I just think, how the fuck? What the fuck? But, they, but, they, they, but they're popular with other people. So I think that the, the, the fact that everyone had a chance is a good thing, but maybe it's a little bit too easy. And I think there's probably somewhere in the middle would probably sit, sit better with me personally. Well, that's what happened with the changeover as well. The bedroom DJ became his own a &R person. I believe in my heart and a lot of the older folks or the ones that know the difference between the old business and the new business feel that quality control went away. Guys like yourself would be the quality control. So you would hear a record per se, like we would send things in early, myself included, and other producers too. And he'll go back and say, I like that. But can you change this and that? And I think that's missing with today's situation. situation. Yeah, it, for, for me, it's a little deeper than that. So everybody wants to be a DJ, right? It's just like it's exploded. Before that, again, there was a big financial commitment to being a DJ. You'd have to buy equipment. You'd have to... Um, you have to buy the music. You'd have to go to the store to buy the music. Time, a time commitment, a monetary commitment, um, and, and and everything. So, uh, but now everyone, you know, technology's made it easy for people to be a DJ, and everybody wants to be a DJ. Celebrities, you know, like tastemakers, specialist DJs, mainstream DJs, and whatever. There's a lot of DJs in the world, um, which which actually I think is in the main is a positive thing. The more people that play great music the, the better for everyone but the thing is i don't think more people are playing great music because what happens now is everybody thinks the 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 road to being popular is to make a record that is a hit in some way shape or form so lots of people are making records on their laptops which really and truly are not amazing your job as a dj is to play the best music in my opinion is to play the best music available to you um and 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 make sure your dance floor gets to hear the best music that you you that, that, that's at the end of your fingertips but when you're playing your own records that aren't very good and that are underproduced and not masters and don't have great lyrical content no musicality or what's whatsoever um and you're playing them relentlessly one after the other after the other that means the dilution of 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 music that's being played on the dance floor it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And I think people are pretty much acknowledging that, that that's what's happened. You know, if you, if you, if you 
dilute orange squash and keep diluting it and keep diluting it, eventually it becomes water. And I think what we have is just DJs playing water now instead of playing the best that's possibly available to them because they think it's the, it's their chance to success. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're Masters at Work or your Purple Disco Machine or your um, Follow More or whatever and your productions are really good, feel free to play your records because they're at a level. But a lot of DJs are playing records that are not even close to being at the level that needs to be leaving the speakers, in my opinion. And, um, you know, because it's not about being a great DJ anymore. It's about being popular. It's about dancing behind the decks. It's, I mean, you know, some DJs can dance well behind the decks, others can't. But I see DJs that don't dance behind the decks being ridiculed because they look like they're boring, but maybe they're playing great music. And surely that's fucking good enough for some people. But the, the world it is today, when a crowd only goes crazy because the dry ice cannon is going mad or there's a, a confetti cannon blast, and that's the highlight of their reason, um, that's just not how I started out. And uh, I kind of think that, uh, uh, you know, traditions need to start, old school traditions and old school values need to start being more important rather than just being popular or famous. Um, that's the way I feel about it at the moment. Thank God for that. In your heart, who is your greatest DJ of all time? <laughs> I could never answer that. I know too many people. Um, come on, come on. <laughs> I there's, there's, there, there, again, it just depends on my mood. I mean, I regularly say that, that Louis Vega is my favorite DJ because, because he can play anything from, from 45s to Latin to house to techno to, uh, I, I was, I was, he played for us at ministry of sound at a glitter box night and it got to three o'clock in the morning. He, he'd, he'd been on for an hour and I was going to go home. I, I, I'd done my bit. The night was rocking. I felt I could go home. I stood and watched him for two hours going, how is he How is he putting that music together? He was finding bits of records in the middle, on the fly, looping them, bringing other records in, going back to the record. He was, it was, it was like, he, he was, he was like a maestro. But, you know, I, I have respect for Giles Peterson because he digs and he's introduced great music to people for four decades. Uh, someone like Osan Lade, again, he plays across the board. Um, I love watching Natasha Diggs because he, going back to people dancing behind the decks, she looks amazing behind the decks, but her selection is on point. Um, and, um, and again, she can play um, Latin, funk, soul, house, disco, and, 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 and you know, uh, with style. Um, but I mean, oh my God, I've probably upset loads of Honey Dijon, energy, 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 relentlessly promotes culture. Doesn't just talk about herself. Um, she talk about some art that she loves or some fashion that she loves or a Chicago classic that she played back in the day. She supports the culture of dance music in a in in, in the way that it should be supported. Um good God. I mean, where do you start? Where do you stop? Um yeah. But though you know, that's just a, a small example. Okay, so here's the other question. Wait, 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 wait. Hey? Here's the other question. So we said favorite DJs, favorite all-time producers of all time. <sighs> Gambler Huff, Tom Moulton, Masters at Work, David Mirai, Frankie Knuckles. Um, uh, so many people. Um, I was, I, I, you know, um, Steve Hurley, East Move. I mean, I look back at my ID, Steve Hurley, East Move, Morris Joshua era, and it's just, you know, Donald Rush stuff. It's just amazing. CC Peniston fight. It's just like, you know, Todd Terry. Um, I just think about Roger Sanchez. I mean, you're definitely the American side of things are is definitely where I felt people could bring the great elements of, of music that I love and, 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 and marry it with house music, whether that be disco, you know, uh, soul, 
you know, a great soul sample, a great disco sample. I mean, house music has always borrowed from other genres. It's always evolved. It's always been a chameleon. Um, yeah. Uh, it, I always feel awkward when I'm put on the spot, my favourite, because uh, um, there's just so much. 40, 40 years of listening to great music, it's impossible to pinpoint anyone or any, you know, or anything. I know, I know, I'm terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, this is something that I just wanted to ask and probably others, that, you know, asking at home the same question. So let me put this out there in the best way I can. Why did you tend to lend yourself more to the American house sound than the UK people? I'm not going to say it, was, it wasn't a 50-50, but... You championed, you came across the ocean, you picked up great records and you brought them back home and you were able to cross them into those charts. Why? Why not do with some of more of the UK people and just, you know, like a lot of the UK A&R guys would do? There was, um, you know, there were UK acts and UK labels that, 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 that I, you know, that I worked with, whether it be, you know, uh, Ashley Beadle, Helen and Farley, uh, junior, you know the junior boys own crew, uh, Express Two, um, etc. But there's something about a mystique of someone that's not from your hometown, and also I think that you know it was it was um, the way that records were produced in those studios with with great musicians, and you know it was like you know Kenny and Louis had a team behind them. Roger had great keyboard players behind him, um, you know, and 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 it just allowed them to. That the rec the productions and the records were a little more for me a little bit more soulful um and uh, a little bit a, a little bit more well produced um you know and, and um and i think that comes from the you know the the prelude days or the south soul days or the philly international days and um and 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 that's just that's just deep within a lot of people that reside on that side of the pond and i, I could just relate to it a little bit more it's a nuance that uh is really difficult to ar articulate and that you know and and it wasn't because i didn't value or respect um people that were closer to home and you know i mean one of my favorite records is 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 tikoi carino um mike pickering produced it and 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 i loved all the early m people stuff and and stuff like that and it was um um it's just i think um uh, I just loved what came out of the US and particularly New York and Chicago more. And I must say thank you for signing my records too. Thank you again. <laughs> and of course, Gladys Pizarro is strictly in the Strictly family. And, you know, we couldn't have done it without a great UK partnership like you provided because you had the same insight what you believe in what we believed in, making great records and delivering a great record to the end. But just just sorry just think about it it's, you know i'm a soul boy and most most great soul records were made in the states and there was some great soul you know like soul to soul and loose ends and there were some great soul records made you know free southern freeze and you know links your line and there was some you know light of the world there's some amazing soul and funk records made in the uk but the vast majority came out of the states and and i don't and i think that legacy kind of moved forward into into house music so so for me it's it's uh, the lineage is is clear as far as i'm concerned so um you know and i, and I remember listening to powerhouse and you know Dwayne harden had just had a big record on uh with armand and whatever so for me it, that record was a no-brainer so no once again, oh, once again. and actually we're coming on the 25th year next year it's 25 years already it's, it's hard to believe that and I'm going to unmute you, but I wanted to make this next part. Getting through the bridge of not only having a record label, like you said, what's the next thing defected in the house and how that progresses into social media. Can you explain that 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 change and what that was like as a record label owner? So Napster came along, yeah? The internet came along. And it just it, it it just changed everything. So you know, Napster came along. We we're all aware of it. Dance music community, early adopters of technology. So we knew that people were file sharing, and and they and they were they were buying 
uh, uh, physical records less. And we, we saw it on our, um, you know, you, you know, yesterday I actually watched a documentary about Tower Records and the documentary is called All Things Must Pass. And when you're that big, sometimes you don't notice the change. It just it just happens. But you're so big, you can't react to it. But when you're small and you look in every week at your income and every month and, 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 and you notice when things start to drop off. And if you don't do anything about it, you're just going to get caught out and eventually you're going to suffer. And, and, and most people ended up dying. But I noticed the change and the downturn. And we sat in a marketing meeting and we talked about all the things that we used to do. We talked about doing ads on Kiss FM or taking out pages in Mixmag and putting street posters up and, and the cost associated with all of that. And the cost associated with it didn't meet with the drop in sales. We, we were going to lose money on every record. And, and I said to my team, right, we can't, we're not doing any of this. We can't do it. It's, it's going to be prehistoric. It's going to drag us down. We're going to take all of that money that we would have invested in traditional marketing and we're going to invest it online and we're going to grow our community and we're going to do things, videos or, or, or programs or clips or whatever, that when we put them online, they're going to be global and they're going to be up there 24-7 and they're going to be up there forever rather than, than something you put a street poster up, it comes down the next week, it's covered over by something else. And then you're, you're hoping that someone's going to walk past it and stop and actually take notice of it. Most times they wouldn't stop, but most times they wouldn't even walk past it. It was so random. And yet the internet seemed to give you more opportunity. So we stopped all the traditional marketing and we went online. Um, and my, my team looked at me like I was nuts that i'd lost my mind this is like how are we gonna put and i was like look i get it we might go two steps backwards even three steps backwards so that we can move forward in 12 months time and that's exactly what happened and we invested all of our money on time and we grew our community so you know initially it was probably message boards and myspace and uh you know uh and and whatever but you know it, eventually it became twitter and instagram and at the same time tracksaw started and beatport started and so everybody was everybody was going digital and we just spotted it really early um and it was it was uh it was a saving grace did you have an inside marketing team or you hired someone on the outside to help you with this campaign we did everything internally. I, I mean, you know, I, I, I get that some people, we, we had a team. I'm a control freak. I have C O C D, right? I like to be able to speak to someone when I speak to them. I like to be able to look them in the eye. When, when things are going well, I like to say, well done. When things are going badly, I like to say, what the fuck? Why is it going badly? Have we dropped the ball here? Is it beyond our control or whatever? But I just need that kind of directness, which, you know, uh, and um, so we, you know, we would event we would initially try to take care of things ourselves until it became too much and then we would hire someone because we needed someone dedicated to do that role so it was a constant learning process it was a constant evolution and it was constant growth and then if things didn't react we would pull back if things reacted we'd we'd we'd, we'd invest more in that whether that be personnel or bigger budgets or you know to get more reach etc it was an interesting time. It was, the, you know, it was like you went from a traditional way of doing stuff. We talked about, you know, being on the phone and faxes and, uh, and and reading magazines. And if you read a magazine and you read a review of a record in a magazine, it was probably two months old by the time you got to read that review. The great thing about the internet, it was probably two days old by the time you got to it. So everything was so much more fast moving and instant. And if you read the reactions... You know, it, if, if the record didn't get a great reaction, you just moved away from it really quickly. If the, if the record got a great reaction, you just put more and more behind it. So you could run your business way, way more efficiently. But of course, you had to make the transition. The transitions of everything were always the most difficult periods in time to navigate. But once you got there and you were there early, um, life was great. First massive hit in this new transition with the streaming. 
for you guys. Nice. Um, oh, definition of a hit. Underground hit, club hit. Um, well, give me a couple. Club hit first, of course, and then you cross over. Downloads. Downloads first, right? Downloads first. Um, Love Generation, Bob Sinclair. You know, that was a record that we pushed really hard as a, a in the download charts. And and uh, the crazy thing about it was the stores would, would only stock top 20 records. And then when the record was at number 38, you couldn't buy it in a store, but you could download it. So, you know, people would leave their offices or their homes or whatever. They'd go to a store and they couldn't fucking buy the record because the store didn't have it in stock. Or they could sit on the end of their laptop and they could just download it and not have to have the make make the effort. So it became really obvious that downloads eventually were going to replace uh, people going to record stores, unfortunately. And I, and and I think that the, the thing that I feel most that I miss about record stores is the guy behind the counter and the other DJs that were in there. The community aspect of a record store. Um, but you know, it's that it's limited by the the shelf space that they have. And the appetite for music is so broad in these times that online was able to 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 fulfill that demand in a way that a, a physical store couldn't. Um, so Bob Sinclair, Love Generation, and then World Hot, World Hold On, um, were our first biggest download hits. Um, streaming, uh, Camel Fat, Cola, globally, mass, massive, massive streaming record. Simon, did you do Cola with the partner, or is that was all done with yourself, the streaming and everything? No, that was the first record that we decided at Defected that we were not going to license it and look for partners internationally around the world. So everyone that bought that record bought it on Defected Records. Um, and that actually was a real reason why the, the, the brand exploded in that time because it wasn't on energy in Italy or happy in France or ultra in America, uh, whatever. Every DJ that played that record played it on defective records. And after that record, we never licensed any records internationally. That was our template. Ah, so the template changed at that point. Yeah, because it's, you know, it's, it's Spotify Sometimes we, we licensed records because we needed the cash flow, and that was an important factor in our su survival. But when streaming started to kick in and we started to see the benefits of the revenue for that, we were a little bit more comfortable in terms of the cash position. We didn't feel we needed to get those advances from the label, so we took the chance of, of doing it ourselves. And, you know, you get once you get past the advance, you're receiving that money directly and, and, and immediately, you're not waiting six months to be accounted to and whatever. So the cash flow position actually improves. Uh, this may be a little bit kind of like, biz, you know, too, too business-like for people. But the advantage of receiving money directly uh, far outweighed, outweighed going, uh, receiving it through a third party. So, um, so it changed the game for us. I don't think people license records in, in these times now. Uh, Spotify is a global organization and and you know if someone listens to your record in in Australia or or Argentina or 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 Botswana or whatever then you get paid directly and it's it's been amazing for the music industry well the difference is now from the old days is is that it's worldwide so you have a record that's a massive hit you can distribute yourself through the through the um through Spotify and you don't have to have regional deals or continent deals now you're able to do it one shot but you were lucky to be able to do be that. able to do that sure and you promote and you know you because your globe is brand you know instagram is global social media is global and whatever so everything aligns pretty well so you know genres of music are, uh, are popular in different you know different uh, different uh areas so, so you know techno is obviously more popular in eastern europe and germany and whatever and house struggles a little bit but house is really popular in italy and australia and, and so it is regional to a, to a certain extent but once you upload a file it's there globally 24 7 you know so the, the the business has changed beyond recognition and the thing that i said to you earlier that was something that i'm i'm most proud of is that we changed with it 
fast enough to survive um and you know being uh, being around for 25 years at some point has meaning and has value i want to give you some kudos i'm going to use this so that you could see where i'm going to go with this robert stigwood rso records and i always say this it took an englishman to come to america to make disco explode through a movie <laughs> What the hell made you create Glitterbox? What was the whole process? The process. Um, so I'm sitting in Ibiza. Um, it's the height of the EDM period, and techno is, is super popular. And I have a number of people call me. I'm coming to Ibiza this weekend. Where can I go? Where can we go out? And I, I, I every week I was struggling to give people a recommendation that I thought was relevant to them or that they would enjoy and whatever. And at the same time, I was coming out every weekend, coming out on a Thursday night, leaving on a Monday, and I would see the same people on the flight, in the lounge, on the flight, whatever. So I could see there was a shift in people coming to Ibiza. They were coming. It's super expensive in Ibiza. So they weren't coming for a week or two weeks because it would it would cripple them financially. They were coming for a weekend. They were just coming for a, for a quick blast and then they would go back home and whatever. So I thought there's a market. And these people were normally a little bit older. I thought there's a market here. There's a market for people that are coming to Ibiza to reminisce. They don't want to go to a techno night. They don't want to go to an EDM night. They kind of want to listen to the music that made them come to Ibiza back in the day. So... Um, I persuaded uh, uh, the guy that owned um, Boom at the time that there was this gap in the market. And I based it on my experience of, of when I first come to Ibiza. Classic records, classic DJs, um, lots of dancers, not necessarily about everybody facing the DJ. Um, and when we opened, it was, a, it was honestly, quite honestly, it was a disaster. We, we, you know, the floor was empty. People didn't really understand it. Um, but, you know, as with a lot of things, it takes people a little while to catch on. And the people that generally went had enjoyed the music, enjoyed the uh, the production that we put on with the dancers, etc. Uh, and we, we got some really good assets um, for social media, Instagram, some, some great looking people, some fashionable people. We booked some great DJs and we just kept posting about it online. Um, and, um, so it was just the fact that there was a, a, an audience and a gap in the market that just wasn't being catered for. And I was just lucky enough to, to spot it. And, and I missed that as well. I missed people weren't playing classics and that kind of like that disco sensibility of, of, of people having fun and dressing up and, you know, making a real effort to go out. And if you go to a techno night, everyone's wearing black. Everyone looks the same. It's kind of boring, yeah. But I wanted, you know, girls to look great and guys to look great, and for 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 gay people to feel comfortable coming, and and just to to bring that whole kind of um, uh, mixture of hedonism back to the dance floor. Um, yeah, we made it bright, we made it colourful, we we made it a fun night for people to go to, and it really resonated. And and people, it wasn't about us telling everyone what a great night it was we tried to make sure that the people on the dance floor told their friends that there was this night in ibiza that was slightly different to everything else that was going on and if you're going to come to ibiza we talk about community um make sure you go to this night and it, it just grew in popularity so i mean there's people do they realize what goes into this, uh, you know, behind the scenes? Do they really think, you know, they see the success now, the glitter box is hot, it's all over the place, but they have no idea the financial situation of you having to be invested into this. What does it take to, you know, what kind of financial, financial investment? Talking about? Talking about? We lost money for five years, the glitter box. You know, it, first of all, you lose money. Then you start to make a little bit of money, but you're just you're just basically recouping the money that you invested initially. Um, and it took five years for that to be a profitable brand business, whatever you whatever you want to call it night. Um, and um, yeah, but you have to stick with it if you believe in something. And that's the trouble with the major labels now and a lot of people now. If it's not successful straight away. People, people walk away from things far too quickly. It takes the public a, a moment to catch on 
for, for them to understand your vision and what you're trying to get across. So you have you have to you if you've got convention with it. I mean, my my promotions girl on the first night of, of, of Glitterbox, she resigned. She thought it was so terrible that she didn't want to be associated with it. And, um, but uh, you know, it, it would have been easy for the owner to, to, to walk away as well, but we were lucky. We had defected at the same club and he didn't want to upset me. So he stood with us. And by the end of the season, the numbers grew from 400 to 1200 and it was a good night and, and, and it made sense then um but it took 20 you know 16 nights that season for people on the island to, to try and understand it that's why i asked you the question because everybody sees the success and glory glory i'm probably going to get I'm, I'm probably going to get this wrong right because i'm probably going to get the wrong title but i think when larry levan played tonya gardner heartbeat first time at the paradise garage he cleared the floor People didn't understand it, right? But he played it like six times that night. And by the end of the night, everybody understood it. And I think it was the same with Glitterbox. We, I just had, I just fucking was like, this is going to fucking work. And I believed in it so much. Um, and, and I was able to do it. So, you know, lucky me. That's what I try to tell people. That, that it's not just about money. There's passion involved too. You have to have a burning passion for success. Yes. Otherwise, if you're doing it only for money, most of the time it can fail. And you'll hear that. But when you hear someone has a lot of heart and passion invested into something, then you see those kind of results. If, I mean, you know, not always, but if you do it for the culture, you can't, you know, you can't lose because you either get you get your credibility and people people value the fact that you've you've done things for the culture. But normally the money the money comes. It may come further down the line. But if you just do it for the money, there's no fucking soul in it. And that's you know, um I look, look don't get me wrong. I defected before I sold it. We employed 50 people. I We had to generate enough income for me to pay my artists, my staff, the overhead. It was it was it was a commitment. And so we had to we had to do things that were commercially minded. But we also did things that were culturally minded as well. It was about having the balance. Tell us about what happens. Glitterbox is really going strong and COVID comes. What's the change for you as far as business model and everything else? Because I remember reading about you writing stuff along the way that you were uncertain if this was going to be positive in the end when we came out on the other side. Sorry. Um, lots of things. Lots of things are uh, um, fa many factors in, in 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 me deciding to sell the business. I mean, it was it was the thing we, we talked about a few of them: the way people are making music, the people, the way people are DJing these days. Um, and it, it's just I come from a different era. I don't want to be the old guy sitting in the corner, fucking moaning about everything. Life's too short for all of that. And who am I to say whether it's right, wrong, or whatever? It's just not what aligns with me personally and whatever. But I just didn't want to. I just didn't want to go through life complaining. Um, so it was already in my mind that I needed an exit strategy. And um, and then COVID come along, and that changed so much. It, it, you know, it's I believe in people coming together and being together. And that's just not on the dance floor. I believe in people being together in, 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 in the office. I believe that, you know, new employees and young employees can teach the older members of staff and the older members of staff can give newer employees the benefit of their uh, their experience and their nuances and, and, and things that they've learned over the years. And you certainly can't do that working from home. So I think that, you know, um what i think the work from home policy is is going to uh, eventually lead us to in the uk is a whole lot of average people that are not inspired by sitting next to someone who's a great designer or someone who's a great marketeer or someone that's a great producer you know studios 
you can't well people do work from home making music they make it on their laptops and i, I think music suffers from that i think mu music suffers because people aren't in the studio together and a keyboard and player and a guitar player and a bass player aren't jamming with each other and that and, and taking a musical composition to a place that uh, 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 that a producer never thought it would get to because you're not in the room together people need to be in the room together because you know people elevate their abilities by being next to someone that's talented and creative and stuff um and so you know when, when we was when we had covid ended and the work from home uh, finished and, and and some of my staff came back in and were grateful and some of my staff were just like what's your work from home policy i only want to come in two days a week and da, 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 da. and i was just like you know what it's time for me to just bow out gracefully because i can't sit here telling someone you've got the fucking greatest job in the world you work in the music industry and you know any one day an artist could walk through the door or a singer could walk through the door. And, you know, you're supposed to be fans of those people and you get the chance to be close to inspirational people, but you don't want to be here. I don't understand that. And um, so, you know, like when I decided I couldn't be a great producer, I just decided that I just wanted to just, I had the best time within the music industry during the best eras, in my opinion, and I just didn't want that opinion to be tainted by the way that everything was going. So I cut it, you know? You know, I, you know, I get it. Along the way, and I forgot to ask you this before, being in the helm as the owner and director and as all, did, and I know you're big into family. Did your family suffer at all with your amount of hours that you had to put in? <laughs> Sure. I mean, I've, I've talked about it. I feel like I have a time debt to my family and my kids. My, my boys want to be DJs. They want to run record labels. I'm trying to teach them the right way. I have time to do that now. If I still run the label, I wouldn't have the time. My daughter is a little bit of an entrepreneur and she quietly gets on with stuff. And uh, she had a couple of business. She had a, a business called Dunmore Designs where she made clothes for people. She didn't make any money, but at least she learned about commerce. Uh, and manufacturing and and you know uh, she didn't lose money she didn't make she she also had a business called fixing kicks where she would clean people's kicks for it was a mail or people would mail her their sneakers so she could clean them and she would mail them back and she paid people for it and i thought that was you know that that secretly inside me that was me hustling back in the day and she was like 18 19 years old when she was doing this and whatever and uh, I want to be there for them. I want to be there for for, for for my wife. You know, she brought my kids up really well um, and, 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 and stuff. So that's another part of uh, why I felt it was time to, to give up because I can now help my kids um, in, 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 in ways that, that are really important to them. You know, Louis got his Sondella label um, and I'm trying to teach him about, you know, the reasons for signing a record, not because it, you're going to make lots of money because it's, it's musically and culturally really, really important to you. Um, and, um, you know, and then DJing and whatever, and that, you know, they look at the world in a similar way to what I do. And, 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 you know, and they, and they, you know, they, I asked them to do certain things and they go, yeah, but I don't want to do that because Jamie Jones doesn't do it or Michael Beebe doesn't do it. And I'm like, that's the reason you should do it. You need to be, you need to plow your own field. You know, culturally, people need to know what you stand for. Tell people about the music that you love. Do charts. Post about records that you love on your Instagram account and whatever. They're still super young. They're still learning. And I won't give up until and, 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 and until they are they get to where they want to get to. Simon, what was the withdrawal process for you like? And the, you know, you've been going and going. What's that withdrawal like? And are you ever going to step back in again or you're done? um it's radical you go from getting you know 100 whatsapps and, and 150 emails and and getting on a plane every day and 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 literally you know getting up from from seven in the morning till 10 o'clock at night non-stop work to nothing it's it's a jolt i'm like fuck what am i going to do with my time and my days and initially you spend your time looking at what stuff that you used to do kind of having an opinion on it and whatever 
um, some things would 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 ricochet around in my head like what the fuck's going on here you know and, and and whatever and then gradually you just find new things to do i have some projects uh some projects in 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 uh property i'm, I'm looking at some art uh with doing a little bit of traveling doing all the things that normal people would do if they led normal lives and they they didn't have a job that was 24 7 and listen those those hours i'm talking about weren't just weekdays work days they were like weekends as well there was no off switch and um uh um so it, it's it's a, it's a realignment but you know it's just like we talked about it earlier some people that are not with us anymore because they worked so hard as well and you know i was 60 last november and i just felt i want to be around when i'm 70 i don't want to die of a heart attack when I'm, I'm 63 so all of these things you know the culture shift covid having time for my children and for my wife my own health they were all pointed in the same direction um but you know and then you just learn to recalibrate yourself i am going to step back in again i am going to give people um if they want it if they're interested, the benefit of my experiences and my and and, and kind of, I, I do believe that things are so extreme now. Everybody le- reads from the same playbook that traditional values are going to become more important. Um, and you know, I have an opinion on all of that. So maybe I'll just uh, start shouting about things as in, in the same way that I used to. Well, we can't. We you know, good men like you don't come a lot, and that's why you've been a perfect role model as far as running a record label, a and r promotions guy. It's something that's in your DNA. I can't see you telling us completely I'm gone, I'm gone, you know, you know, no, I had to, I had to, you know, um, take a step back and recalibrate and, and look at, look at things with, a with, through different lenses and, and, uh, et cetera. And, and just, I just couldn't go continue to go, um uh and and work in, in in that way and and uh and 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 I think the universe is challenging for a lot of people now and and uh I think that a lot of people get sucked into they see success and they want to replicate it but success is is is, is not just about monetary value you know and I keep repeating myself about the cultural value of things and having longevity and standing for something um, and and uh, those values need to be um, represented to artists because I think that everybody just looks, well, not everybody, but most people just look at the fast tracks of success and not necessarily the hard work that sometimes makes a difference. So truly grafting and the water adds and stir doesn't work in this game. You gotta, you still got to put the time, time in. in. I mean, you know, if you get lucky and you have a viral moment and it just takes you past all of the all of the hard graph that you need to do, sure. I mean, you know, but if you can do the hard graph and you get the viral moment, at least you have good principles and good ethics and you have integrity and you understand the slog and why that that's important as well. Um, if it comes too easy to for you, sometimes you don't have that depth that I think is really important to an artist that that is really... Uh, meaningful to a lot of people <laughs> off kilt i gotta ask you this question football is the national english pastime which team do you support simon i mean um i su- i support qpr which is is a uh, 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 an example of a really terribly run business and football club um, so i look at their results i don't go anymore it's uh it's not good for my soul to, to, to go and feel angry. A bit like I was talking about music, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was one of the questions that came up. They wanted to know, you know, your allegiance. Um, I, I think for what we have done today has been monumental and we've covered a hell of a lot of, of uh, ground. And I think one last question is where do you see the next – parts of music going i know because you've been part of the glitter box thing and soulful house thing do you see this 90s golden era thing making its resurgence back or do you see something changing differently i think that i hope that people see the value of collaborating 
and 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 the value of of real musicians you know i i, I often say if kings of tomorrow finally and fish go deep the cure and the cause and and uh, were released today that uh, it, they may not be hits because uh, um, because people find it really hard to support new music. When you're a DJ, you know you, you're, you're re-editing classics because it's it's easy for you. But the future needs classics as well. We can't keep playing the same records, and I hope that will be recognised. People will go in and make new music, and and producers will collaborate with vocalists and songwriters and string arrangers and 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 and, and make music that has some some real depth to it and longevity um and will be the dance floor records you know it, like someone like dames brown on defected may not hit the numbers today but i'm kind of hoping that a future um a future drake or a future eminem or a future 50 cents will sample that record and it will have its day and become popular again because culturally it was relevant enough for someone to go found this record from back in the day and not many people know about it, but geez that loop that loops something special in the same way as you did when you when you looped um Thelma houston i'm here again for powerhouse you found that record and it meant something that one moment and then it just and then you put a song on top today people would just do the loop they wouldn't put the song on top i'm hoping people will find the vocalist and put the song on top of a great loop or some great music or something that someone's produced. That's what I'm hoping. Me too. <laughs> That's always been the problem. It's because a lot of these guys now, it's like we said it before, just add the water and stir. And they want just quick hits. They want to be in and out. They don't want to put the time in. But the thing is different from back in the day to today, shelf life of tracks, two, three weeks. Weeks. That's a big problem. So to make that financial investment for some people, they don't see it. You want to be, you, yeah. You want you want two, three decades, yeah. The re the records we talked about now. I mean, you know, don't leave me this way. Five decades, five fucking decades. That's how long great music lasts. So let's strive to make great music. Let's strive not to make a record that lasts just for a weekend and plummets out the Beatport chart 10 days after you first released it. Let's strive to make that record that in 50 years' time, whoever's doing Croatia or playing in Ibiza will go, I'm going to play that classic because it, it it's had that resonance for 50 years. It's that good. Yeah, that's what we need to strive for. Not, not, a, like, not a moment. <laughs> I know. I battle this all the time. Time. Good. Yeah. I don't think we can go anywhere from there, Lenny. <laughs> no, that's it. You you covered you covered everything. I'm just sorry if I mute you. I you covered everything I can, you know, possibly think of that people are thinking at home and stuff and what makes someone like yourself tick and what's the thought process behind your madness. Because that's really what it is. Because sometimes you see things others don't see. And that's what makes you who you are. You are. But isn't that a DJ hearing a record? It's, it, it literally boils down to that fundamental thing is listening to something and hearing it for the first time and going, I know the place for that record, whether it be on the dance floor or on the radio, or even if it's just at home, you know, when you're making out with your partner, you know, the re a record has to have a meaning. What is the meaning of that record? um and then and then just just be in the ambassador for that put you know just go in i'm going to champion this record and um you know i don't know who, who where to go for the champions these days so anyway there you go i don't want to be the money old guy i feel no, like I'm no you're going to be the money old guy because i'm going to ask you to, to leave us on a high note to so these young kids that are watching this what's the formula for them that they should be doing now what's it in for them now what's what so that we create the next champions yes. find your own lane don't follow don't be the second somebody be the first somebody look at what 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 you're passionate about and what you believe in and champion it and and just be fearless just go for it. Don't play the same game as everybody else because nobody wants Mark II. 
everybody wants the real deal so be the real deal on that note thank you everyone for tuning in to mr simon dunmore who's live broadcast us from ibiza in his beautiful garden and he was been a pleasure to hear him tell us all this without without having anyone banging in his door saying, Simon, you got to take this call. Simon, you gotta... he was able to be eloquent, relaxed, which is not something I normally get a chance to see, but it's nice, nice that we were able to have this time together. And I don't know if there's anything more you want to say, say. No, I'm just, a, I'm just a little puzzled, Lenny. I'm puzzled, right? Because you said Powerhouse is 25 years old, yeah? Okay. And you're 29. So that made you four <laughs> when you made the record. And I know, you know, I know people start young that side of the pond, but uh, that's uh, that's pretty impressive. So uh, congratulations <laughs> on your birthday and thank you for the invitation. Much, much appreciated. Um, and uh, to anyone that has listened, I hope that uh, it's been insightful and uh, um, believe in yourselves. Be, you know. We're waiting for you to make a difference. And on that note, everyone, thank you for all of you for tuning into Trust Stories. Don't go anywhere yet, Mr. Dunmore. And everyone, have a good night around the world. Catch us next week. We have more in store. And once again, toodaloo and good night. Thank you.